Jimmy K here, Metal Voice. Look at this. The Metal Voice shirts are now on sale. Just go to the video description to find out on how you can purchase one. Metal! Hey, what's happening, Artemis? Uh, it's great to be here with you. We've seen the premiere of Street Survivors. You made it, man. Here you are, and in Los Angeles, the premiere of your movie at the uh, Independent Film Festival, Los Angeles. So what do you think of the film? How did it turn out? Is this, this, is this your story? Is this the real story of what happened? It's the story of what happened. And uh, we did, I, I think, a really good job. Uh, the director, all the actors and actresses, portraying um, you know the band and everything and I when I say that we did the best we could I'm not discounting the movie <coughs> I'm just saying the entire time that we were doing the movie we were being sued and we had thousand dollar an hour blood sucking weasel attorneys coming at us the entire time so I think Jared Cohen the director I think Brian Pereira and Tim Yazui that, that kept the faith and and uh, and the whole crew. I think they did a good job of telling the story. Um, it was my story, and I didn't realize it was going to be my story. I thought it was going to be more general, but it was basically focused on what happened to me. And uh, you know, I, I think it, I think it's going to be a cult classic. I think the the movie was riveting. It was fantastic for me because I was there when. In 1977 when I was a kid and I was in Florida with my my family and I read it I read it in the newspaper I heard about it on television and you know I was a little kid and I was just shocked about you know one of my favorite bands that I heard on the radio because I didn't have many albums back then but uh, it was it was a heartbreaking thing and but to see this in the film in the theater it was um, to me it, it it was moving it was touching it was it made me want to break into tears there was you know Obviously, there was a plane crash, and that, that part of it was uh, brutal to... I, I just can't even imagine what it's like to go through something like that. And just just the story that's that's happened, um, you know, from your standpoint, do you feel different after this movie being played in the theater? What does well, the, that feel the like? movie's intense, and it tells that part of the story. But there's also a, a humor, and it's sex, drugs, and rock and roll, man. I mean, that's honestly... That's the way it was in the late 60s and, and 70s. Um, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Uh, I'm not particularly bragging about it, but that's the way it was. And, uh, you know, in the movie, everybody's smoking cigarettes all the time. And uh, that that's one thing that kind of bothers me. But back in those days, everybody smoked. And my guys in my band, they chain smoked cigarettes. So Ronnie Van Zandt, he was the real original rock and roll outlaw. I mean, really. I don't know about original rock and roll outlaw, but he was definitely a rock and roll outlaw. Now, he would probably tell you 10 people that were outlaws before him. Uh, but Ronnie was definitely a, a prolific writer. And, and he, uh, rock and roll outlaws related to him. You know, and, and a lot of people love that music. I've heard so many stories about how much people love the music. So in the movie we weren't allowed to use any of the skinner music i guess you noticed that we used um call me the breeze yes and we were able to license that song for the movie because uh it's not a skinner song it's a jj kale's song so judy, judy couldn't block that and um i'm real disappointed in judy and gary and all of them i'm really disappointed in them that they didn't come with me to make a better movie, even a bigger movie, you know, with a bigger budget and more, we could have done some location shooting and stuff uh, with a bigger budget. But Judy and Gary and Vector Management, they chose to try to destroy me rather than come to the table and let's make a, a film together. So this is what it turned out to be. And I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud of the director, uh, of, of Cleopatra and all the kids that played us, man. I'm really proud of them. And and regarding your first wife, I know that's a, a heartbreaking thing, but, um, you know, you bared your soul in the movie, and of course we'll save that, but, you know, you, you, know, you put it all out there, and, and I have to give you, you know, maximum 
impossible respect because I mean to be to go through everything that you've been through and to be here standing in front of the movie theater where the, the, the premiere just happened it's just an honor for me to be here with you Anonymous. I'm very proud of you and it's an inspiration to me well thanks man I wanted to mention that about my wife because um, I wish I would have been a faithful husband but I wasn't and you can't take that back but like I said she forgave me she loves me we talk every day you know and uh, we're friends and that that's a big deal and that's because of her uh, she's such a cool person and I, I love the girl that portrayed her uh, in the movie uh, between Ian the guy that portrayed me and the girl uh, it was very loving and that's the way we were Pat and I were very loving and she's a very sweet girl so the movie is accurate everywhere that it can be except for sequencing and timing and everything you can't get it all in you know and uh and did they really did they really try to like the dea try to frisk you down for for ginseng oh they 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 tried to bust me for ginseng yeah they took me to a, a big all, armory uh, and all of our stuff was laid out and i could smell the perfume and the cologne of all my friends in that room I could smell their luggage. I could smell their fragrance. So you had to relive this thing over. And, and I, over I, I had to this. relive it. And, and I'm standing there and all these people from DEA come up and they start talking about this ginseng that I had in my luggage, which I used for uh, vitality. Ginseng, it's a, it's a blood cleanser. It's good for you. It gives you energy. It's natural. And I told them, I said, are you guys kidding me? You've never heard of the old Sang Hunters, you know, that look for ginseng? They sell it and they use it. It's all legal. I said, it makes you smarter. You guys should take some. Well, thank you so much, Artemis. I know you have a plane to catch. I yeah, don't want to, to keep you, but you're you're an inspiration to everyone. And, you know, thank you for, for your your amazing work and, and for making this film. It's it's really, it was incredible to watch. And I, you know, it was a tearjerker for me, but I mean. It, it, it is. It's, it's hard to, you know. It's, it's intense. It's hard to fathom. Or it's intense, not... but thank you for coming, and it's great to see you. And you got my number. Call me anytime. Yeah, and we love Artemis Pile Band, and you're watching the Metal Voice. And thank you so much, Artemis. I hope that uh, you get through LAX because I know it's a, a fun airport to try to jump over the hurdles to get into. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Good night, buddy. All my best. Okay. Uh, there's a. A few things that are pretty obvious in this in this movie. Uh, one, it's very emotional, and um, so, of course, I'm snotting all over myself. Um, I've seen it a few times, and I know the cast hasn't seen it, um, and they're probably in shock right now. So there's a couple of things pretty obvious. Um, there was a lot of nudity. And I just want to point out that in the 70s, that's what it was. Um, do you remember a thing called streaking? Yes. Right? So men and women would take off all their clothes and they'd run out across the stage at a stadium where we were playing for 100,000 people so they could tell their grandchildren that they ran across the stage naked while we were playing Freebird. Um, and that's true. So there was, there was nudity. It's not just gratuitous. And the other thing that's pretty obvious, that should be obvious, is I was unfaithful to my wife. And I held out for a pretty good long time the guys in my band, the truth is, they hit anything that moved. But um, every once in a while, I fell off the horse. And it cost me a relationship. I would give anything to be the guy that's still married to his sweetheart that he married. And Patricia, and, and I, I thought the, you know, the portrayal of Pat was really good because she is a very sweet person. Where's Patricia? Oh, hi. <laughs> what, what, what are you, you're part of the cast. 
you've made a star out of my wife, and so you have to come out. Um, but she, but my my first wife, Patricia, was a wonderful person, and uh, and we are still still friends. And the reason we're still friends, uh, not just because we have two sons together, but because of the grace of her character. If she wasn't the way she she is now, um, I'd still be locked out of her life. But she's such a good person. She forgave me for being a dumbass and being unfaithful to her on the road. And that's my biggest regret of my life, that I was not faithful to Patricia. That's something that should be obvious in the movie because of the nudity. And you saw a couple of places in the movie where it was funny. This is a story about a tragedy, but there were places where I, I heard everybody laugh because there was a lot of humor uh, with the band. And with the CGI now, with the special effects, that scene of us going down, it's very hard to watch because um, I don't want anybody to, to ever have to experience something like that. But um, now you've seen the movie, I feel as though it tells the story. Uh, we had to do a compression of all the Skinner gigs and all the backstages and all the stuff the day before, the day of, and the day after the plane crash. So we had to compress everything together. So you saw the band play, you saw me get the gig, you saw after a show, us critiquing the show. And Ronnie, you know, was very mad about if, if we didn't have a good show. And, uh, and then you saw back at the hotel. But um, enough can't be said for the efforts that were put into this, the making of this movie. You know, Skinner fans and younger fans, they're not getting any younger. Uh, and I thought it was time and, and so did Brian Pereira and Tim when they flew to Nashville to talk to me about this. And we all felt that it was time that the Skinner fans see what we went through and how intense it really was. And the farmer that shot me, he denies it. He, he, says, he says, oh, I didn't do that. He didn't want to be the good old country boy that, you know, well, Leonard Skinner crashed on my, my property. One of them lived, but I shot him. He didn't want to be the guy saying that. So he said, he told Jake Tapper from CNN, you know, yes, I had a gun. Yes, I pointed, pointed it at Artemis. And yes, I pulled the trigger. But I didn't shoot him. And Jake Tapper said, well, how, you know, how can you say that? He goes, well, it must have been a ricochet. And I was already in shock from the airplane crash. When I got hit in my shoulder, it spun me around. And it confused me because I it felt like a bee sting. I didn't know what it was. I was in shock. So, for Jared, uh, where are you, where are you, Jared? The director, um, I, I, I think that Jared did a great job. Don't you guys? So, with the budget that we had, with the budget that we were able to pull together, that all the guys worked on. This is the movie we were able to make. I am very proud of it. I'm very proud of all the actors and actresses and everybody at Cleopatra Films. And uh, now it's out there. And I think this movie will be a cult classic, much in the spirit of Reefer Madness. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, well, that would be good, that would be good. Reefer Madness, yeah, I think it will good. be a cult yeah, classic. Thanks. So <laughs> help me thank uh, everybody up here. Anyone has a question? Yeah, uh, does anybody have a, a question? Ask me a question. Oh, I have a question for you. What, how accurate is the, is the depiction of the two pilots? 
Um, Did you interact with them? Because one of them is kind of like a stoner who I wouldn't fly anywhere with. The way he was like, hey, well, that was John Gray. That's the guy you're talking about. He was a truck driver. And he said his dream was to drive a big rig and fly on an airplane with a, a rock and roll band. And he, um, he was kind of a, you know, fly by the seat, seat of your pants cowboy. He made some, a lot of mistakes. Did he have a license? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, both pilots were licensed, but they weren't uh, licensed for multi-engine. Uh, only the one pilot was multi-engine rated. And we found out some things in their past where they had overshot a runway, they had to pick the plane up and put it back on the tarmac. So they had made some mistakes. And the biggest mistake was, I'm sure you saw in the movie, you can't trust the gauges on a 1947 airplane. You have to take a stick, put it in the tank, and look at it. They forgot to do that. They didn't do that in Greenville, South Carolina. And that's the last place that Ronnie Van Zandt ever sang Freebird. So Walter McCreary was a very quiet, um, methodical, you know, he, he's a pilot. Um, they, every time you have a plane crash or an incident, like where there's a, a major catastrophe, there's several things leading up to it. And the pilots made a lot of those mistakes. And, you know, we made mistakes, um, carrying too much stuff. We had ample, that's what he meant when he said, uh, they have all, they got a bunch of new toys. That means guitars and amplifiers. I just want to say one thing. I've been around a long time, too, and I have never met a man that walked away from a plane crash. Ever. My, so, my question so is, you are really lucky to be alive. That was my third airplane crash. I've had three. You should drop. No. Have you flown since then? Oh yeah, I'll fly all the time. Okay. <laughs> I wouldn't, you know. Well, planes are different. I, I get on a plane nowadays, y'all, and I just say my prayers and leave it up to God. I don't like to fly if I'm not flying the plane. Um, when we flew out to Vegas, you know, recently I drove from Morganton to Nashville in the last couple of days and then flew from Nashville to Vegas, did that show with Billy Gibbons last night at, at the, the Sahara. And Billy Gibbons still rocks from ZZ Top. Y'all know who I'm talking about. And uh, then drove here today. So I'm a little exhausted. And I got to get on a plane and go back to Nashville and rehearse with my band. And uh, last week, I just want to say, I'm, I'm bragging now. Um, no problem. We opened up for Dolly Parton. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. We, uh, we played at the Ryman Auditorium in Nashville, Tennessee. And it was a, a cancer benefit. And we did Freebird. And I mean, we took the roof off the Ryman. We got a standing ovation. Dolly noticed. She came out, gave us all hugs and kisses. She's amazing. What a humanitarian. I've got a big crush on Dolly. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, we're going to have to clear the theater. I'm getting the, the light. But we are going to have the director say about a few words. And then uh, if you want to continue this, we do have an area in the mezzanine where we can uh, sit and chat all evening if you guys would like. That's up to you. <laughs> okay, so that's it. Uh, here's, here's Jared. What's next? And we're gonna talk for a minute, then we gotta go. I, I've got a few minutes, but I'm, I'm late. I, got, I do have to get on a plane at midnight. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, no, I just wanted to uh, thank the festival, you know, and everyone for coming out, uh, as well as uh, this man right here, Brian Pereira. That man, organist, the cast, the crew, my lovely girlfriend for putting up with my craziness, and uh, the legal system. As you know, we, we got sued in federal court in New York, and we lost. And then we appealed. And then we won. And then we won. So, That's another story. Yeah. So we actually, the whole story was is we had a judge that liked Judy in 1988 when the whole band went for a lawsuit. The judge liked her, he flirted with her, she flirted with him. Years later, he still liked her and he didn't like us. So going into it, we already lost. In the appeal, the new wave of the justice system is a different system. They're not bullies, they just believe in how things work and we actually won and now I'm thankful this movie is actually coming out and 
seeing the light of day and and that's what I wanted. Like I knew that we would get to get this movie out, but it was a lot. It was a struggle. I had to deal with a lot of legal, a lot of money, and relationships suffered from it. But then now it's recovered. Now, for instance, what he's talking about, he was in Paris and had to fly back to New York to go before a judge, and have the judge release his his uh, your. Uh, Finances? Your finances. Yeah. He, he froze your assets. And I had two broken wrists at the time. And you so had two I'll broken wrists. Stress. So the judge said, yeah, I, I see you do business all over the world as a record company. The, the film was only a part of your business. And so he released, you know, uh, your money so you could continue to do business. But the, the thing is that they told me that I'm not allowed to tell my story. Judy Van Zandt said, Artemis is not allowed to tell his story. And the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, three judges, that's our Constitution, said that I am allowed to tell my story. Uh, it's a First Amendment. So this was, and the last thing I want to say, this was a landmark case. I think it is. Yeah, I really believe in the justice system that it will prevail, that you may get shut down the first time, but if you really believe in the rights and the rights of human people that you will prevail and things will come out good for you. First Amendment. Yes. Yeah. Let's give everyone a big hand. We've got a right now. Hey, uh, don't we get any playoff music? Aren't they going to play some music and play us off? Get ready for the ride We're going down to hell tonight So strap yourself inside There's a glaring contradiction In your world